I'm so glad you're here today for our first official meeting of 2023. I'm Cynthia Blackwell. I haven't had a chance to meet you. I'm the president of the club this year, and it is a privilege to, um, to honor this club with my time. So if you haven't already, I suggest that you put all of the club dates on your calendar. Go ahead and be proactive about it and see um, if you can work your days around it so you can be with us. Also, if you're not already a member or if you've not renewed, there are forms in the foyer. Just fill it out, give it to me. It's easy as that. All right, so I will introduce you to Matt, our speaker today. Let me start by apologizing for the inaccuracy in the presentation title. It implies that we're talking about a group of composers who, on a whim, also did some other things. The truth is, we're going to see some people where the composing was the side job. The other job, whether it be the side job or the main job for these five people, are a botanist, among other things, a chess master, an astronomer, among some other things, a fencer who has still some more skills on top of that, and a physician chemist. Let's start with, the, these are in chronological order of birth. We'll start with a botanist. Not just a botanist, but a figure of significance in the Catholic Church who practiced Christian mysticism. Uh, from her youth, she was having what she and the Church understood to be divine visions. Uh, she, uh, documented these visions with the encouragement of the church in multiple works, the first one being Skivigas, where she discusses 24 specific visions she had. The frontispiece illustration on the left is uh, intended to represent her having one of her visions as she's inscribing information about it and speaking information about it to her assistant. Uh, her day job was being a nun and after not too long uh, an abbess in, for the nunnery. She um, actually established two different nunneries, after, uh, the first one after moving the original nunnery from the original location to what she said was divinely inspired for a place to establish a brand new nunnery. After that was established, she, uh, her, the same group of nuns established yet another nunnery in parallel with that. She was offered the job of being prioress, but turned that down because she figured that that would compromise her, um, her freedom to pursue things as she understood what was right. She would have been working on behalf of somebody way too much had she accepted the prioress job she was offered and ended up being merely an abbess. Uh, we're talking about her now because of the work she did that earned her the moniker of the mother of German botany. It's, uh, Physica is one of two of her works regarding the, the natural sciences, specifically the uh, mostly botanical substances that one could find and what effects these things had on human maladies and uh, additional information on how these human maladies worked without regard to whether botany entered into it. And she, one of her appellations is the Sibyl of the Rhine, uh, paying homage to her as a healer. She was renowned for fi fixing people up in an era where medicine was not as we know it yet. 
And she is a saint. Although, strictly speaking, she hasn't been a saint very long. The paperwork originally went in for her to become a saint nearly a millennium ago, but it wasn't until, uh, oh, when was it, 2012, that the Catholic Church finally rectified an issue of lost paperwork and through a side door declared her, no doubts, officially a saint, even though the normal process had become completely lost centuries earlier. She'd been called a saint for the intervening centuries, but she never had been canonized until the modern day. And she was a, I won't call her a prolific composer, but in terms of what is still extant in this day and age, for medieval composers, she is to us prolific that there are not people with significantly more work still extant than her works. There are, in addition to the 69 referred to on the slide, she wrote four additional works for which we have, I, I believe it's the words but not the music. And most of these were single pieces, of which you'll hear one, but there was one, um, um, I, I do not recall how she titled it, but it was a, a, a collection of individual songs. She worked in uh, monophonic uh, song, as in the Gregorian chant tradition, but she went way beyond the official limitations of the Gregorian chant, as you'll hear momentarily in how melodic her work is. We're talking about Hildegard von Bingen. Prepared 
affidavits after the fact indicating that primarily we did do this. His name is associated with three different specific things in chess, although it's questionable why it should be associated with one of them. Uh, there is a class of Rook and Pawn versus uh, Rook in games associated with his name where he demonstrated that Black is defending here against the Pawn promoting on that square. What he demonstrated is if Black moves his Rook to this third last rank, he will be able to prevent the King and Pawn from advancing to the promotion square unless White does something like offer to exchange Rooks, in which case it's still a wrong game because White cannot force this Pawn to promote with Black already up here and White not in front of the Pawn. So his name is permanently stuck on this class of in-game. He's also associated for questionable reasons because it was in the literature over two centuries earlier, a particular kind of smothered knight. We have the knight here checking the king, but the king is so boxed in that he can't move out of the check and the knight is not being attacked by anything so it can't be captured. What you don't see here is the moves leading up to it. Very dramatically, the queen comes down here to check the king, and the only way to protect against it is for the rook to capture the queen, creating the boxed-in situation, which can then be exploited by the knight uh, attacking from outside the box. And ignore this chessboard. You cannot tell anything about the B defense that uh, his uh, name is associated with. Simply, I'll say that um, the, the typical open game is pawn from e2 to e4, op opposing pawn from, uh, from e7 to e5, and move the king's knight out to f3. His defense was to move the queen's pawn up one space to support the, uh, the already moved king's pawn. And this, at the time, was a very competitive defense. These days, you see this defense relatively rarely. There are much better ideas floating around, but they're also much more analyzed. So if you're facing an opponent that you fear has better analyzed and better prepared for the traditional things, you may very well use the defense that our composer is known for. Because it's, it is staid, stolid, somewhat boring, and not expected. Our, comp our composer is Philidor. Uh, specifically, François-André Gatacan Philidor. I should point out his, he's known mostly as André Philidor, but André is his father, so it can get confusing if you don't realize there are two Andres. Gatacan is actually the family name. His grandfather was nicknamed Philidor, his grandfather the oboe player, because the King of France was impressed with him and was reminded of, a, uh, of an excellent Italian oboe player named Filidore. So that's where the Philidor moniker came from. <laughs> and Philidor, let's see, uh, let me try to start it just for reference. Uh, I think that was me. So there was something different about the ability to start the first video. <laughs>
there's this is one of the cases where you could argue over whether he's uh, a composer dabbling in something else or a something else dabbling in composing. He actually was in, uh, professionally in music because there wasn't a profession of astronomy really at the time. However, from a modern perspective, we think of this man as an astronomer, not as a composer. He just happened to pick up money as a composer. When he created in 1789 this monster telescope with an aperture of 48 inches and as was the custom of that time described as being a 40 foot telescope because they refer to focal lengths instead of apertures when talking about them. This was the largest telescope in the world. It stayed the largest telescope in the world until 1815 not because there was a bigger telescope, but because it, this one went out of commission and the biggest telescope in the world was smaller. Uh, this was actually too big a telescope. He actually exceeded the ability of technology to create a worthwhile telescope of such a large size. He was more productive with his so-called 20-foot telescope, which was easier to move around, easier to manage. But uh, he's best known for this monster telescope. There's actually a photograph of this telescope between when it went out of commission and when it was finally taken down. Photography it was in its infancy. There is no photograph of our composer, though, because he died over a decade before his own son invented the word photography. Uh, at the time, mirrors for telescopes were made of speculum metal, um, roughly speaking, two parts copper, one part tin, which could, could take a bright, shiny finish, except it's not all that bright and shiny. Uh, really good speculum metal, like on the left, un perfectly clean, will reflect about two-thirds of the light and absorb one-third of it. On the right, that's a modern, uh, illuminized telescope mirror, which is much more reflective. Because he was fighting with these speculum mirrors, he did not use what we think of as the Newtonian design, commonly used in, in, in this day and age, where light bounces off the, the main mirror at the back and then bounces off a diagonal to get to a conveniently placed eyepiece. He said, if I'm gonna have a diagonal, it's gonna lose light, it's gonna lose a third of the light. So I'm gonna cheat, I'm gonna tilt the primary mirror so that I need to have the eyepiece at the edge of the front end instead of bouncing off a mirror from the middle of the near the front end. And this design of having the eyepiece crooked off to the side of the main opening is to this day known for him. Uh, the illustration we have in the lower right corner is his uh, uh, 20 foot telescope. He also discovered that solar radiation contains infrared light. Um, if you're not familiar with infrared light, just think of it as even redder than red, except our poor impoverished eyes don't have the ability to detect it. But if you have animal eyes that happen to see in the infrared, it's just another color. And he discovered it in sunlight. On the right, you have the original engraving from his publication of the discovery in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. Uh, a much easier to understand illustration is this modern illustration of the idea of putting the sun's light through a prism and then letting only one color of light come through and hit a thermometer and see what the temperature of the thermometer becomes compared to a reference thermometer that's not getting any light. And he discovered that if he leapt through a space next to the red where he couldn't see any colors, it behaved just like it did for the red, only more so. Here. Come on, backing up. Here. Uh, what he found was that uh, green made his thermometer react more than blue, red more than green, which turns out not to be an artifact of what's in the sunlight, but the fact that a prism spread.
spreads out the blue much, much more, so you're not getting very many different colors out of the thermometer at once, and spreads out the red much less, you're getting lots and lots of colors on it. But he discovered that beyond where you could see colors at all, it was still acting like it, there was yet another color. So he's known for discovering infrared radiation coming from the sun. And now we're collecting infrared radiation with, among other things, the uh, James Webb Space Telescope and doing marvelous astronomy. There's actually an earlier space telescope from the European Space Agency that is named for him. He discovered a planet. He initially thought that it was a comet. Um, it had been discovered many times before by people who had no suspicions whatsoever and just assumed that it was a stationary star. He noticed that it didn't quite look right for a star. And then he noticed that it was moving slowly. Eventually it became obvious that it couldn't be a comet, it had to be a planet because of how slowly and how uniformly it was moving. He named it uh, Georgium Cetus, trying to curry favor from his king, Georgium, King George III. But after some decades, the uh, world settled on calling his discovery Uranus. He also discovered that coral is not a planet. He looked at it with a microscope and said, there are no cell walls on this. This isn't a plant, this is an animal. We're talking about William Herschel. And the star up in the sky, he discovered not only Uranus, but the two biggest moons of Uranus, and the two innermost major moons of Saturn, which had not yet been discovered for lack of sufficient technology to notice them before his telescope. But his day job is being a composer. Let's see if this one starts for me. His, uh, the movie 
uh, Chevalier is a partially fictionalized account of his life. Uh, there's, for instance, a scene where he's doing dueling violins with Mozart, culminating in alternating sections of violin cadenza at each other and beating Mozart, although the violin playing he gets into doing sounds like it's from a dist distinctly more modern century that he was in, and there's no evidence that he ever did run into Mozart on stage to duel with violins, although for a while it's known that he lodged under the same roof as Mozart. There's also evidence that Mozart was inspired by him. And back. We're talking about Joseph Baron, known as Le Chevalier de Saint Georges. Uh, that title in and of itself is somewhat dubious because French law at the time made it improper for someone with African heritage, and his heritage is half African, to be in the nobility, yet he had this title. And then when the French Revolution came around, all titles theoretically evaporated, yet he was still being referred to as this. He's been nicknamed the Black Mozart, although probably in the modern era, not in his own time. And he's actually Mozart's elder and an inspirer of Mozart, so perhaps we should be calling Mozart the White Baron. <laughs> and he uh, prepared several operas of which only one survives to the day, Mama Amarine. And
most often associated with this process these days because uh, another pair of people generalized it, but he did do the groundbreaking work for the case of producing methyl bromide, which was not practical to produce until he invented this method. Uh, his name is also says, uh, this is more illustration, I can skip over the details of how the reaction works. His name is also associated with the aldol reaction where you uh, can end up with two aldol molecules linked to each other with the release of a, of a water molecule, which time doesn't allow us to go into in detail. And he even had a one ruble coin issued uh, commemorating both his chemistry work and his musical work. We're talking about Alexander Borodin. Uh, his name is associated with one well-known opera, Prince Igor, which he did not actually complete. He died before he finished the orchestration for it, and the remaining orchestration was done by Rimsky Korsakov and Glazunov. And but the, the earlier portions of it were completely fleshed out by him before his death. There is a third, there are three acts to the opera. The third act is short and very often does not get performed on the theory that that is the least Moradine and the most filled in by others. But recent research suggests that there's a whole lot more Moradine in that third act than was ever given credit, and it's unjustified not to perform it just because it's not his. So, uh, Borodin is known for being one of what we now call the five, although they didn't call themselves that, the group of five Russian composers who did not come up through the formal European musical education. To, uh, to update the computer. <laughs> um, uh, the, these five did not have formal standard European musical training and were making a deliberate effort to compose uniquely Russian feeling music. So Tchaikovsky, for example, was the enemy rather than one of them because he had a standard European musical upbringing and they thought that he sounded too much like those Germans, for instance, although we, from our standpoint, uh, feel that there's something uniquely Russian in Tchaikovsky that they weren't acknowledging. The example we have here, let's see if I can start it. I don't know if I just started it. Yes, I did. to complete the, uh, the orchestration and hand it back to him. So 
You have Rimsky Korsakov for the exact turns of phrase you hear in the individual instruments, but it was Borodin who decided what those instruments would, have, would be playing. So uh, I defend it as being Borodin, just as we all accept the, uh, the Mozart Requiem Mass as being Mozart, even though it was his pupil, Zeusmeyer, who cleaned up the loose ends that were there with, uh, with Mozart's death. In this particular case, though, the loose ends by far predated Borodin's death. It was just Rinsky Korsakov was too impatient for his friend Borodin to finish it by himself. So that was the fifth of the five. Um, a couple of uh, anecdotes about these people. Two of these five were illegitimate, which seems to be a little bit higher than the average for composers. Three of the five composed operas. Three of the five had asteroids named for them. <laughs> and three of them uh, can be clearly seen to be scientists, but there are arguments that the other two, in a way, are scientists. If you have to describe Philidor as just a chess player, there's a recurring theme in chess that chess is, among other things, a science. And Saint-Georges, if you can describe him in only one non-musical way, it's as a fencer, but there is also a recurring theme in fencing that, in part, fencing is a science. So in a way, you have five scientists, not just five non-musical people who have dabbled, sometimes illustriously, in music.